Welcome everyone, we'll be started in just one moment. Thanks for joining us. All right, welcome to the Better Buildings webinar series, um, which is dedicated to bringing you the latest actionable insights from leading industry experts. This annual series is a chance to explore the topics, technologies, and trends that affect your organization, as well as efforts to accelerate energy efficiency adoption. Today, we are joined by um, three wonderful leaders in commercial real estate who are gonna be speaking on PV valuation, how solar PV adds value to your assets. But before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping items. The first is that today's webinar will be recorded and archived on the Better Building Solutions Center. So we'll follow up when today's recording is available um, and you'll get that over an email and you'll have access to the slides and the transcript and all that good stuff. However, um, that also means that all of this will be recorded, but we have a good tool for that slide I'll get to in a moment. The other housekeeping item here is that um, all attendees are in listen only mode, meaning your microphone is completely muted. If you have any AV issues, please reach, please reach out on Zoom using the Q&A function, and we'll be able to help you from the back end for that. And that box is located at the bottom of your Zoom panel. And again, that's a Q&A if you have any AV issues. Next slide, please. I'm your moderator, Hannah Debelius from the US Department of Energy. I um, work in the Building Technologies Office and have the wonder, wonderful privilege of working with our commercial real estate partners in the Better Buildings Program. Next slide. Today, as you all know, we'll be talking about on-site PV, which is a really important step in a pathway to decarbonization and a pathway to zero carbon. But taking a step back into the bigger picture of that pathway, we are inviting um, you know, organizations to join DOE through Better Buildings for the Better Climate Challenge. And by joining us, we're asking you to commit to a 50% reduction in scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions over the course of 10 years. We're really looking forward to working with partners through technical assistance and collaboration to identify these pathways to zero carbon. And I hope you're interested in joining us. If you are, please reach out to your current Better Buildings point of contact if you're already a partner with us. Or if you're new to Better Buildings, you can reach out to betterbuildings at ee.doe.gov or just go to the Better Building Solutions Center where you can also check out a fact sheet for more information on this. Next slide. With that, I wanna introduce a little bit more about the topic today. Um, solar PV or solar, solar photovoltaic, of course, is what PV stands for, is um, you know, an on-site renewable energy option that's open to most building types. And we do know that rooftop solar is increasingly deployed as a renewable energy strategy, and leaders in the space are exploring how different models and approaches can contribute to the asset value, depending on the ownership structure and the different business model or approaches. Better Buildings has been working um, to explore this topic for a little bit. So we do have three published case studies that talk about this topic from different angles of ownership and um, strategic decisions. And we'll continue that conversation on today's webinar with our panelists who are all you know, coming from different sectors within commercial real estate and different approaches and experiences. We can go to the next slide. So today we will be using a tool um, for all of our Q&A as well as some polling so that we can really get to know you all and you'll have the opportunity to interact with our panelists. So right now, please open a new browser or on your mobile device, go to slido.com and enter the event code DOE. So again, go to slido.com and enter the event code DOE. That's again where we are gonna be doing Q&A so you can enter your questions anytime there. You also can use a, the little thumbs up icon to like another question, and it's where we're going to be doing some polling. So um, speaking of that, we are going to get into our polls right now. So again, please open up that extra browser because we are going to roll into it. Our first question is just to get to know you all a little bit more. If you could please tell us um, what sector best describes your organization. 
All right. So it looks like we have a lot of people from the industrial sector joining us today and commercial real estate, which is great. We are um, focused on general commercial sectors today, but of course there's a little bit of something for everybody in PV. Um, a lot of state and local government, um, contractors and consultants. We also have that represented on our panel today. Um, nonprofits, higher education. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to see this because this is a really great balance of a lot of sectors, which also shows me how um, important the topic is that we're talking about today and how many different strategies there really can be to approach PV uh, valuation. All right, I'd like to move on to the next poll, please. Um, this one is getting into our topic. So if you could tell us, what is your level of experience with solar photovoltaic? You know, this will really help our panelists to understand, you know, where we are and how to talk about the topic today. Um, so it looks like a little more than half of you so far are considering it and here to learn, which is a great place to start out. We're going to cover a lot of different approaches today. Um, so I think you'll definitely be able to pick up on the, the getting started piece. And it looks like about 20% of you have already completed at least one project. Um, or are actively planning for it. All right, and then we've got 6%, a couple of um, experts on the line here that have rolled out PV across your portfolio. So um, congrats on that. And I hope that you will um, put forward some question, some great questions to our panelists in particular. All right, excellent. Well, it seems like there's a, a lot of interest here to can to consider it and learn. So with that, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, I'd like to welcome, um, oh, actually, <laughs> right, there's one more, uh, there's one more question here. Thanks so much to the webinar team. Um, and that last question is, what barriers do you face in acquiring and installing solar PV? Um, this is a short answer, open-ended, and we're really just hoping to hear more examples of what you're facing. Yeah, funding, budget and payback. So a lot of considerations around the business case for PV, which makes a lot of sense and is um, certainly a focus for, you know, the approaches that we're going to talk about today. Yeah, economic payback. Okay, a lot of a lot of financing and funding barriers I am seeing. Um, return on investment. Um, lack of internal buy-in, I think I saw, which is interesting. Maybe that's something that we might not have on the agenda, but um, hopefully our panelists uh, are able to maybe work that in a little bit of how they've been able to grow buy-in within their organizations. Um, logistics and on rental buildings, definitely leasing is um, can be a challenge, and I think we can cover that today. All right, interconnection, utility interconnection. Okay, so working with utilities. All right, this is great. So I'm hearing a lot on financing and business case, some on buy-in, and some of just those logistics, maybe working with different um, stakeholders and then the technology logistics as well. All right, well, it certainly seems like there are uh, a decent amount of barriers. So with that, now we'll move over to the panel and hopefully get some uh, solutions or examples there. I am very glad to um, welcome Brenda Wallraven, excuse me, Rena Wallraven from Corporate Sustainable Strategies, Sam Stockdale from Link Logistics, and Katie Rothenberg from the Tower Companies to our panel today. And we are gonna be kicking things off with Brenna, who's an internationally recognized leader in the real estate industry, and an accomplished author, a sought after speaker, and a talented instructor for more than 25 years. Brenna founded Corporate Sustainability Strategies to help clients develop and execute strategies in areas of real estate operations, resiliency, ESG and carbon neutrality. Um, it's been a long time friend of Better Building, so I'm glad to have you on board. And Brenna, Brenna please take it away. Thanks so much, Hannah. Yeah, great to be with all of you today. Saw some good feedback, and so hopefully we're going to answer a lot of questions either during our sessions or after. If we can go to our next slide, I'll, I'll put some context and level setting. So when we talk about asset value, we really want to talk about the entire real estate investment life cycle. And if you see these um, kind of boxes here, these are all points where you can create value for real estate. I think today we're going to focus on the middle three, which is if we can design and build a property uh, to create value uh, where solar is part of that solution, um, it's a value creating opportunity. Certainly doing leasing and stabilization. So we're going to connect the dots of where solar can be a lease. Um, and then management and operations. We want to connect the dot to where solar can be part of 
you know, hedging uh, your price and your cost for energy at a property. Um, and these are op opportunities where solar can create value. So if we move to the next slide, turning off my phone to make sure I don't disrupt. So what we're really talking about in terms of value add concepts, I wanna start with just a, a little level setting on the right. Um, when we talk about net operating income, that's really taking all the revenue from the property, take less all the expenses, gets us to net operating income. And net operating income is usually the primary valuation technique for creating value. Um, and that's how a property is measured. Um, so connecting those dots, if we think about one way that solar adds value is through leasing of rent. Um, excuse me, roof, um, is leasing of the roof and creating rent on a space that, you know, maybe historically isn't getting any revenue. Um, but it's also an opportunity to use renewable energy. Um, and again, as I said, price hedge your cost of energy through getting a long-term kind of fixed price with typically a CPI increase that is usually at or below tariff or what you would otherwise pay from getting it directly from the utility. And then lastly is this community solar, where you can not only, again, get uh, provide renewable energy to the community for low-income homes and households, but also often the businesses can opt in um, for your, from your property to get access to that lower cost energy. Next slide, please. We've, I just focused a little bit on the value side um, of what's accretive to value. Um, around solar, getting additional roof rent uh, or getting roof rent at all, getting uh, increased rent, um, lowering your operating expenses. But I also wanted to just touch on that solar and, and sustainability in general can be a defensive value protector. So not just enhancing, but protecting your value. So we're seeing that increasingly um, climate uh, risks can be addressed through using solar. I'm going to give you an example of that here in a second. Um, regulatory compliance risks. We know that more and more jurisdictions are focused on carbon reductions, 100% renewable or net zero. So solar can be part of that uh, solution as well. Reputational risks. We think there's increasingly going to be focused on who's a good actor um, in real estate and in corporate America. And solar can be part of that solution. It also helps that it's visible. Anybody uh, driving by on the freeway can see buildings with solar. You're flying into a neighborhood, you can see it. So these are some of the protectors of value, not just a creative value uh, proposition. Next slide. So this is um, uh, showing uh, from the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures or TCFD, what are some of the transition risks associated with climate change? Um, and I'm gonna give you an example of where that worked for solar. Just briefly, these risks include you know, shifts in the market. So if you're in a jurisdiction that you know, uh, floods every time, not just when there's a storm, but every, anytime it, there's high tide or it rains, that might change where you might locate a building or want to lease. Policy and regulation, I talked about that. You know, we're increasing, increasing requirements for net zero carbon reductions. And this is another place where solar can add value. Resource availability, you know, examples of that, Northern California and Southern California have been fighting over wa water for many, many years. Georgia and Florida are fighting over water. So this is an, another climate related risk uh, that's a transition over time. And then lastly is reputation and market, uh, market uh, position. So how is your reputation? How are you being perceived in the marketplace? Renewable energy can be a key part of that. But specifically, I want to face, if you give us one more click, You'll, I want to focus this on, uh, next slide. Yeah, there we go, um, on resource availability. Um, and I've had industrial clients, uh, large distribution warehouse owners say to me, Brenna, we're not by any coast. We don't really have exposure to these kinds of risks. Um, but if you go to the next slide, give it one more click, you'll see the example. This is uh, PG&E, who is the largest utility in the state of California. This is from 2018, um, and, and coming out of the Paradise Fire, devastating fire, which not only killed a lot of people, uh, it actually burned down an entire town because a transformer in a very windy time uh, toppled, caught fire, and you know created a travesty. Uh, what came out of that then is PG&E started saying, hey, we're going to shut down power uh, because it's windy, not because there's a fire, but because it's windy. 
Um, and not, I don't know about where you live, but in a lot of parts of the country, it gets windy a lot and often. So this could be a risk where large swaths, and again, we're not in the middle of nowhere, we're in the uh, Northern California major markets for real estate investment, where large swaths of the power were shut down, not for an hour or two, not even for a day or two, but for a week or more. Um, and so then you have to ask yourself, what happens to that industrial building in Tracy, California, when your power is getting shut down? Again, not once in a blue moon, but very regularly every time it gets windy. This is where solar can create resiliency and keep you uh, keep your property able to stay online, able to conduct business um, and work. Next slide. So these are just a couple of examples, and I think um, Katie and Sam are going to get into some details of the great work they're doing. But just I really wanted to reinforce where community solar could be a real opportunity. Um, these are typically 20 to 25 year uh, roof lease terms. You typically do not have any capital outlay. They can be scalable, meaning we can do them broadly across your portfolio where there are opportunities. Um, but the other big benefit is it not only uh, delivers utility bill savings to low to moderate income households, but usually your tenants or your occupants uh, or your business, if you're in a corporate or, or a government facility, you can take advantage of those discounted uh, utility uh, bill savings as well. So the other big thing as it relates to value, coming back to my kind of first big slide, first and second slide is solar rent is capitalized at really the same overall rental rates that are in the building. It's a long-term stable lease. You don't have turnover. It's going to pay like clockwork. Um, so it's really adding tremendous value in that way as well. Next slide, please. This is a home stretch and I want to connect the dots. So again, the core function of real estate owners and operators is to add value. And really solar can be this I'm leasing found space, if you will, roofs, parking lots. So you can put canopies over surface lots to hold the solar or on a rooftop of a parking structure, you can add canopies to provide solar. And now you've created not only, again, either lower energy costs for the property or uh, a rent, uh, for the property, but you've also created cover parking, uh, which is also desirable. You may have excess land um, that isn't going to be developed in the future. That's another opportunity area to create value. Um, but if we looked at this graphic on the right, the way to think about it is if we can get green energy at or below tariff, tariff and make our operating expenses uh, more competitive, um, we can also enhance our brand and lower costs, which leads to uh, retention and higher occupancy, which if I have a stable long-term lease, I have less downtime, which means I not only have lower costs, but I also have increased revenue if I do this lease model, all of which drives higher asset value. So it really does correlate strongly, and I think you're going to love some of the examples and, and details that we get into with Katie and Sam. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brenna. I really appreciate you adding more on the context for why and then an overview of some of the different options. Um, I want to remind everybody that you can submit questions anytime on slido.com, event code DOE. Um, and I know we're getting a couple of questions um, in there about whether slides or recording will be available. So as a reminder, this is recorded. Slides, recording, links will all be available um, after the webinar, and we'll follow up on email with that. So with that, I will um, gladly be uh, welcoming our next panelist, Katie Rothenberg, who's been executing sustainability initiatives in the built environment for nearly 15 years. As Vice President of Sustainability, she is responsible for leading and, and maturing the tower company's industry-leading sustainability and renewables programs. This work spans across a 6 million square foot owned and managed portfolio of residential and commercial office space. So thanks so much, Katie. You can go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Hannah. Um, and certainly welcome, everybody. I know that we're super excited to be sharing a little bit about our solar program today in the hopes that that can help inform, you know, opportunities for you all within your portfolio. So next slide. Um, you know, before we get into the nuts and bolts of it, I think it's important to sort of understand uh, who Tower is, because obviously our structure um, informs the way we do things as it relates to solar. So we are a family owned and privately held real estate company. We're actually celebrating our 75th year uh, this year, which is, which is exciting. We're locally focused. So 
Um, our portfolio is all based in the DC metro area, some in DC proper, some in neighboring Montgomery County, Maryland, which is really right over the DC line. And we're vertically integrated. So we develop own and manage, which of course as a sustainability person is, is sort of a dream because we've got, you know, I have the ability and we have the ability to control all elements really of the life cycle of, of the building. So as Hannah said, we've got about a 6 million square foot portfolio. Um, mostly office and residential, but we do have some retail, and we also have about 13 million square feet in the development pipeline. To the right here, you see a quote, which you don't see this very often. This is actually part of Tower's mission statement. So think about that for a second. I work for a company where we are envisioning a world where buildings inspire and enrich the lives of their occupants and help sustain the environment. So I think it says a little bit about how we've used sustainability whether it's renewables and solar or net zero, et cetera, um, to, to drive value for the firm as far as reputation, right? Just as Brenna was talking about. So next slide. We've been at this a long time from a green building perspective, very early adopters of many of the third party certifications that are out there and long time partners of um, the Better Buildings Challenge with DOE and have always really felt like we have an opportunity to you know, because we're small, because we can be nimble and don't have outside investors, we have the ability to try and do different things and really always want to share our experience with others in the hope that that helps inform or make for a better outcome. So um, we've been carbon neutral since 2010, and we do that by purchasing offsets, uh, renewable energy credits and carbon offsets for 100% of our greenhouse gas emissions. We've been doing that since 2010. Um, and that's actually separate from our on-site solar, which we can get into in the Q&A if that's of interest. So next slide. So here we are, a little bit about our solar program. And I hope if there's one thing you take away from this slide, it's that um, it comes in all shapes and sizes. So to the left, you see our first solar installation, which was actually at 1909 K Street in Washington, D.C., it was the first uh, it was the first solar installation on a multi tenant office building in DC, and then you see our most current, which is the carport solar project picture you see there in the Center which we actually flipped the switch on today, which is exciting it's about a half a megawatt hour sized um, size system. But again we've got small systems we got larger systems we've got uh, you know we've put solar um, on you know, 1960s vintage buildings, um, rooftops. We've also put it on buildings that were developed in the last few years. So again, our experience, I think, runs the gamut. Next slide. So again, a little bit more detail sort of by the numbers. We've, we have five uh, solar projects that have been completed to date and have another three that are slated to be completed here over the next couple of months. Um, and with that completion, we're expecting that 5% of towers total annual electricity demand will actually come from the sun. So about 4000 panels, majority of which are American made. Um, we're doing it again on both our residential and office portfolio, which we can talk a little bit about um, as we go further. And then also for those there was lots of questions about payback and financing and you know how do you make the numbers work, etc. Um, those five solar projects that are completed, they all have case studies written about them, some by um, DOE, some by other partners. And so the links um, there in blue will give you a little bit more information about our process and how we were able to make the case. So next slide. So let's talk about ownership model. As Brenna said, there's a whole lot of ways you can go about financing or not financing in our case. Um, your solar installations. So once we had a detailed analysis, you know, a preliminary design for our first solar project, we dug way into the details um, to understand the, the performa, right? And understand the payback. Now, remember, we are a family owned, privately held real estate company. So we are holding these assets for a very long time, which means that we have the flexibility to make decisions about paybacks you know, we're not, you know, we can take a five-year payback, right? Which is most of these, most all of our projects have really come in at a five-year payback or less, some as low as one year. But we worked very closely with, you know, the tax team, especially, um, you know, accounting, engineering to understand, you know, what do the numbers look like? 
Um, and what we found was that a direct purchase was going to be the best way for us to go financially, which isn't the case for everyone. Um, but a lot of that is because, because of our structure, because we are privately held, because we're holding these assets for very long periods of time, um, we get to take advantage of all, really, of the short and long-term incentives that are out there. So the federal investment tax credit and accelerated depreciation, those drive a lot of the financial case for us because of the way you know privately held real estate companies are structured. Um, so the ability to take down your tax burden is a big deal. Um, but we've also taken full advantage of rebates, both from um, Maryland, from others. Um, and then we also have made the decision to sell our solar renewable energy credits. So that was another way to bring in some cash flow um, to help make the business case. And then as a reminder, we've set this up as sort of a behind the meter system. So this is net metering. So, um, so the electrons from our solar panels that are on the roof of our residential building are, are flowing to our building first before we're then drawing electricity from the grid. So if you go to the next slide, you know, that really translates directly into electricity savings because our electrical demand has gone down, which of course, as real estate people, we know that that's increasing NOI. And when you're talking about that over a five, 10, 15, you know, 20 year period, when you're capping that, that, you know, there's real value there, certainly. Um, obviously having lower uh, cost per square foot for operating costs, there's, there's certainly value for that as you're um, leasing office space to tenants. That's a question that's obviously being readily asked and understanding the lease structure and how that's going to impact, you know, who gets the benefit is important. Um, in the DC market, we're looking at modified gross leases. And so um, we found based on our analysis that we're getting the vast majority of the benefit of our um, efficiency measures, both sort of operational efficiency, but also the reduced electricity demand. Residential, of course, the savings are again coming directly to us um, as the owner. And you know, before I close, I think I, I want to remind folks that there's a lot of value in sort of translating these savings and translating these programs into a story. You know, when you're talking to an office tenant and you say, you know, we've got on-site solar that um, you know is attributed to you know one percent of electricity demand, like it goes right over their head. It doesn't mean anything. So think about how to make these um, numbers make sense to folks. You know, so you know our solar panels are able to power our elevators for a year, or it's able to power um, you know, hot water heaters or whatever. Um, it just, it helps make it a little bit more tangible for folks. And next slide, um, I would say on the last, the last piece of that is on the residential side, there's also sort of this more qualitative element of values alignment. You know, we've branded our Blair's residential district, which is about 27 acres in Silver Spring, Maryland, um, as uh, really an environmentally eco-conscious community. And so having on-site solar aligns very well with our green roofs and aligns with our you know, um, farming plots and our CSA access and the fact that we're buying renewable you know, wind power to, to, to you know, offset all of our GHG emissions. All of that weaves together into a story, which when you're trying to differentiate yourself in a, in a tough market, um, you know, all every every bit helps. So I think the the value proposition is not only on the you know NOI tax savings, quick payback, et cetera, but it's but it's also on these um, maybe the softer side again, depending on what sector you're working in. Um, and so with that, I will hand it back to Hannah. Great, thanks so much, Katie. I really appreciate you um, sharing some stories or giving a nod to the to the buy-in piece of it. Um, that's been asked a lot and also, as well as owner owned, which has come up in Q&A. Um, as a reminder for everybody, we will have Q&A at the end and we won't have time for all of the questions that are in there. So I would encourage you to go in um, to slido.com and use that thumbs up button where you can like a question because that bumps it up to the top for us to see and we'll be taking those first at the end. Um, with that, I would like to welcome our final speaker for today, Sam Stockdale. Um, as Vice President, Head of Environmental and Sustainability at Link Industrial, Sam Stockdale oversees ESG, as well as corporate sustainability strategy and execution for Blackstone's largest portfolio company. 
Sam has worked to implement programs that advance innovation and disruption in the asset class, more broadly, including social impact, utility operations, energy procurement, building solutions, and energy data analytics functions. Um, so Sam, uh, you can go ahead and, and take it away. If you want to turn on your video as well, we'd love to hear from you. Here I am. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Uh, and also, terrific job to, to Brenna and Katie. Great pre presentations. But um, I'm Sam, and um, I'm thrilled to be here. I love any chance I can get to talk solar because in my in my prior life at JP Morgan, we raised and executed a billion dollar fund comprised of solar storage and fuel cell assets. And so today, I get to go back to my roots. And, um, and since I'm bringing up the the rear of the presentation trio, I thought that I would skip over all the high level stuff and dive right us into some specific examples of how we evaluate and think about value attributable to solar. Um, but first I'd like to start with a quick turn through who we are. And so next slide, please. Uh, because we're, we're relatively unknown uh, and I can confidently say that we're the largest company you've never heard of. Um, but we were created in May of 2019 by Blackstone where as their US logistics platform for industrial manufacturing and distribution center assets within their real estate funds. And actually we, we move so fast that I think even the slide is already out of date because I, I, as I sit here, we've exceeded 440 million square feet across 3,700 properties rounding out about $80 billion in assets under management and a 4.5, actually, excuse me, $5.4 billion development pipeline. So that, that makes us Blackstone's largest uh, portfolio company globally throughout, throughout all of their, their managed funds. And so um, today is just a couple, a couple of fast facts about us. Um, and actually rather than going through them, I think what's most interesting after having heard Katie and Brenna go through their presentations is, is to compare us um, at link to more traditional commercial real estate firms. Um, and so, you know, in relevance to today's subject around solar, I wanna stress about how industrials um, are different. Um, and for, for us, the rents are relatively low um, compared to more traditional asset classes like, like office, and, and they're typically um, under five years. And so, and so when I say low, by the way, I mean that we generally are under $10 per square foot per year, depending on the regions. And there, there are regions where, um, where this asset class is going through the roof in terms of cost per square foot, but generally uh, we tend to be in that, in that range. Um, but on the least term, uh, you know, a fun fact is Right now, my average remaining tenor is three and a half years, and I generally have between three and five different units or tenants in a, in a facility across my portfolio. Um, and the last thing is, is my customer and lease type. I think industrials over the last few years has, been, um, has become really synonymous with the, with the big names like Amazon, FedEx, and, and Walmart. And, and while these Fortune 500s do have market moving capability, the vast majority of our customers, they're small businesses. Um, and in all of them, large and small, use triple net leases, right? So that means that utilities, among other items, are in the customer's names and, and not our name. And so I'm, I'm telling you that because um, the value of how we think about solar in industrials typically doesn't accrue for behind the meter in this asset class. And I know that I saw that I think 14% of you are coming to us today from industrials. So I'll be curious to know if that statement resonates for you or not. Um, that's not to say we don't have a handful of PPAs because we do, um, but managing multi-tenant facilities where we're churning an average of at least one unit per facility every year, it introduces um, accounting complexity, depending on how the site metering is set up, given we don't have master meters at many of our facilities. It introduces recovery complexity uh, for when units become vacant and that utility run rate becomes a non-recoverable expense for us as the landlord. Um, and lastly, we, we, we generally don't monetize the tax benefit. Uh, so the prospect of bringing on third-party tax equity financing introduces a third barrier to direct investment, um, which, is, which is kind of what, what Katie just took us through. So next slide, please. And so, so for those reasons, we prefer to plug into community solar programs. Um, and this is where we lease the roof to a solar developer. They push the energy and the rec or the renewable energy credit into the state or utility sponsored programs, right? And so since we're not taking delivery of the electricity nor retiring the renewable attribute on our behalf, we can't claim that we're renewable, but we can still set targets around facilitating new renewable capacity on the grid where we operate. And so today I'm gonna to take you through our, our goal setting methodology and then how we forecast new revenue and thus create, create value. 
Um, and so now that we've decided to pursue community solar as our preferred transaction method, we, we need a few things, right? Um, and so first we want large roof plates and through some trial and error, we found that any roof under roughly 50,000 square feet is usually not worth pursuing for us. Second is we want core assets and Katie alluded to this as well. Um, since a typical roof lease is similar to a PPA, right? You're still in that 15, 20 year um, um, term range. You, you really want, you, you don't want those to be on your, um, on your disposition list. And thirdly, we look for roof ages under five years, similar to PPAs, right? Or for properties where we have a roof replacement in our five-year capital plan, where we can pull it forward if the project looks, uh, looks favorable. Um, and then lastly, and maybe most importantly, we need these, all those specific requirements to funnel in or, or line up with states with active community solar programs. And so here on the right on the map and then below in the grid is where a link has assets located in states with either mature community solar programs, which are in the primary markets in the black. So that's California, Illinois, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut. And actually look, looks like looks like my letters for New Jersey and Maryland took a walk, but but they're in there in our primary, um, our primary target markets. And then in purple, we're, we're looking at those as our secondary markets. And so those are states with nascent programs or, or programs in development like Washington, Oregon, Colorado, and Minnesota. Um, but here's, here's the challenge. Um, now that we know how much opportunity or how much pipeline there is, which is the grid below, um, we need to know what the possibility for actually getting into these programs is because community solar programs, as many of you might, might know, they're really competitive um, and they have limits for how much capacity they can accept in order to satisfy the community optic demand. Um, and you can only begin the installation once the community program has accepted an application and award an optic agreement to your, your property and your development partner. So in short, this can be a pretty long road to getting solar on the facility in comparison to just direct PPA or direct investment. Um, and it can take sometimes as long as two or three years. And so since our development partners control most of the variables in the application process, it's a bit of a passive approach to solar development and, and poses some difficulty for us to forecast the value attributable to all this solar. And so the, the link pipeline that met, all, or that met all this criteria is in this table. So you've got around 270 megawatts of potential solar. Um, but like I said, understanding how likely we are to actually go out and be able to develop this solar uh, and then in what time frames we can go out and communicate a goal to our investors um, and our customers and the community at large, um, we have to do a, a kind of a simple exercise in probability and statistics, which helps us understand the value side of the equation, which I'm going to take you through now. So next slide, please. There we go. So I'm going to take you through these two box plots on the right. And you have the capacity on the top and the revenue on the bottom. And so what we're doing here is we're using historical community solar program award rates and the assumptions below. And we're really trying to understand two things. We're trying to understand one, how long will it take for all the properties to get accepted because you want to come out with a goal and we need to convince our leadership and Blackstone that the goal is achievable. And then two, we want to understand how we should forecast the revenue and communicate the value created by this program to those same stakeholders. And so you can see under the assumptions there that we had acceptance rate boundaries provided by our experienced solar development partners that are listed there and also some consultants that we were working with at the time. And we assume that if a project didn't accept it or didn't get accepted in 22 or 23, that there is a delay so that we can build in some additional buffer to be conservative in our, in our modeling exercise here. Um, and now we simulate. Uh, and we simulate 10,000 times to be exact to come up with medium value ranges in our normal distribution bell curve which are presented in the box plots. And, and it tells us two things. One, that there is a 98% probability that all assets would be accepted within four years. And actually, I probably, I should have started this presentation by saying that this was an exercise we did in April of 2021. Um, and then number two is based on those capacity targets and historical values of rent per megawatt by state, which unfortunately I couldn't share. Uh, we got to a total annual revenue target of around $15 million of new NOI created by all these solar leases. And so with this analysis, we're able to take this back to our leadership team and say, hey, we think not only does a 2025 solar goal seem pretty achievable based on our probability assessment, um, but we also think we can drive about $15 million of new NOI during that same time period without deploying any capital. Um, and so for the final piece, 
um, that both Brandon and Katie touched on, we can just do the simple cap rate math, right? And um, you know, right now I think a reasonable cap rate is maybe four and a half percent, but let's use four percent just to be conservative. And if you take the fifteen million dollars of new NOI divided by your four percent, you've got three hundred seventy-five million dollars of value creation um, from all this solar, which is a which is a pretty good day here for Link. So, um, so as I said, this this exercise is something that we completed last spring. We came forward with a public um, solar target of 300 megawatts by 2025 based on this analysis. Uh, in the last nine months, we have actually, we're already 21% of the way there. In nine, nine months, we've had a lot of uh, some, some good partnerships. We've installed 64 megawatts of, uh, of new solar. And so I'll, uh, I'll conclude by adding that we are working on some new creative pathways for behind the meter solar solutions so that we can take delivery of the renewable energy for ourselves and for our customers. And so uh, fingers crossed, if I get invited back next year, I'll have something um, new and a little bit more exciting to talk about. Um, but thank you, and back to you, Hannah. Great, thanks so much, Sam. I really appreciate you kind of diving into the numbers and data with us. I think that's a really helpful um, perspective, especially at the scale you're working on. Um, so with this, I'd like to invite all of our speakers back on video. Um, we're gonna be headed into Q&A. Um, so as we switch over to bringing up that Q&A panel from Slido, I will say that it's not too late to still um, vote in your top questions. We have over 40, so we won't get to all of them, but um, you can certainly try and, and push some to the top if it's of interest. Um, excellent. Well, I'm going to jump right into it. So the first question we have here is how does solar create resiliency if it is grid tied with no battery backup? And I think for this, um, Brenna, I'd like to start with you since you brought up this, this topic a little bit at the beginning. That's a, it's a great question and um, appreciate noting. You actually do need to have um, battery backup to really get true resiliency. It certainly will shave load off peak demand, um, which is not only a bill rate reduction, but is also resilience. So the less need for peaker plants, during you know, peak uh, times of, of the day. But you're right, we, you do need to have um, a battery that gets stores up the energy. So when the grid goes down, which will shut down your power by design, we don't wanna get people electrocuted, then you would be relying on the energy storage. But we're just seeing more and more pair those together to get resiliency, but great question. Thanks, Brenna. Um, would any of our other speakers like to weigh in before I move to the next question here? No, I guess I would just add it's something we've looked at in the past and that the numbers didn't quite make sense for us just yet, right? Um, so, yeah. but we are seeing that start to change. Um, and so we'll be looking for opportunities to do that into the future. Yeah, I, I think for on, on my angle for the in front of the meter solutions, we are seeing that batteries do make a big difference because batteries are able to create new revenue streams and ancillary capacity and congestion markets so that those developers can pull in not just the, um, the rate from the community solar, but they can also arbitrage certain other uh, utility components. And so we are seeing that that contributes to our ability to drive better or greater roof rents and therefore greater in Great, thanks, Sam. I think we'll move on to the next question then, um, which is how do you justify life cycle costs for installations on existing roofs? Um, invalidation of roof warranties, roof penetrations, cost of roof repairs. Um, I think, um, Sam, since you all have rolled this out pretty extensively in your portfolio, do you think you'd be able to kick yeah, us off Yeah, and actually there? I'll, I'll, I'll draw on my experience, not, not here from, um, from Link, but, but in my prior experience at Chase where we did about 2,000 rooftop solar installations on, on Chase Bank branches across 23 states. And so um, we, we actually had to drive a parallel roof replacement program to, to live with our solar program for, for this exact reason. And, and it did dilute the cost. I think that we were running generally like a call in an 8% on levered IRR on the on the solar part. And then when you fold it in the roof, we were we were down to between a four and a six, um, which, which I understand is probably not going to be um, doable for, for some folks, depending on their, um, you know, their, their cost of capital. But, I, but generally what we learned is um, we'd never wanted to penetrate where possible, except for in Florida, where you had more strict code requirements to deal with, you know, increasing shear winds from hurricanes and loading. Um, and, you know, we, we wanted to work with one specific develop or, or um, roof warranty company 
And so at the time we, we had a bid out to both Carlisle and GAF, which are basically the, you know, the 600 pound gorillas in, in roof material manufacturing. And we had them come over and either do their EPDM roofing um, or, the, or the EPD or the, is it the TPO, uh, the rubber on, on light roofing right ahead of the roof project. And if we couldn't do those two things, we generally use an off ramp to say goodbye to the project. But I think if you're, if you're gonna do it at scale, I think, I think they have to live together so that you don't void the roof warranty. And so you don't end up with issues across roof penetrations. The scheduling was, uh, was tough getting the, the PV partner and the roof partner to go in and repair pitch pockets or, or do everything else kind of uh, in tandem. Just I guess like to I, add to that, if I, if, if I could, Katie, did you want to go next? Sorry. You can go next. I can jump okay. in after. I just wanted to just add building on uh, what Sam's getting at too, is I just want to add the point too, that solar has gotten a lot better at this gig, meaning that, you know, there's ways you put pads under the equipment. It's less heavy. Um, you make sure your lease agreement or your agreement with the installer makes them responsible for the roof warranty. So they are required to engage with the installer and the warranty and make sure that they're installing in a way. So there's things you can do, not only that the equipment's come a long way and installations come a long way, but even in your contracts and your agreements, you make those requirements part of that. I just wanted to add that point. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, and I guess what I would add is that, you know, most of our systems, our rooftop systems are ballasted systems, so they don't require all that many penetrations, which helps. Um, and then the other component is that we are absolutely looking at, you know, the useful life, you know, what's left of our roof and looking to have at least 10 to 15 years on, a, on, um, on the roof of any project we're looking at for solar. Thanks, everybody. I think that definitely speaks to some of the, um, you know, points about having the right stakeholders internally and externally on board with that, and then aligning with um, all those timeline considerations. Excellent. Well, I think we'll move on to the next question, um, which uh, is what is the most important lesson that you've learned from <laughs> that you've learned from the solar installation portfolio? What do you think you can make it better? Um, and for this one, maybe Katie, can we start with you? Yeah, I was going to, it actually aligned pretty well with the comment you just made, Hannah, about, I think, bringing all the right people in the organization together. Um, our, you know, we own, right? So we, we own our own solar projects. And so definitely there were lessons learned in our, in our first projects. And I think we've gotten better at it over time. And so, you know, I don't know that we always took into account all of the internal time it would sort of take for our own project managers who are, you know, as Brenna said, the solar uh, companies have gotten a lot better at this, um, but there's still a lot of coordination amongst a lot of different groups. And I think making sure that you're taking that into your calculus is important, but also just recognizing that it, it truly does take a village. If you're really trying to bear out the numbers um, and understand, you know, the useful life of your roof and how this is going to impact leasing or property management, um, never mind the tax implications. Th there's just a lot of internal coordination that's incredibly important because when you've got those really solid numbers, it's much easier to sort of take that to the bank, right, with ownership. Great, thanks so much, Katie. Sam, are, uh, Sam it looks like you're unmuted. Would you like to weigh in on this as well? No, no, Katie nailed it. Got okay, one. great. Um, excellent, well then we'll move on to the next one. I appreciate your perspective on that, Katie. Um, the next question is, when trying to determine ROI, are there any costs that are often skipped or overlooked when trying to determine how long it would take to see positive returns? Um, so maybe, Brenna, since you've looked at this from a couple of different perspectives, are you able to kick us off here? Sure, sure. Well, so first of all, when you think about return on investment, right, you have to be investing something. So in Katie's model, um, they're investing. So certainly speed to getting the system up and running is a determinant to accelerate that return. For most of what Sam's wanting to do, he's not spending capital. So there's not a return on capital uh, or return on investment. But there are costs. That doesn't mean it's completely cost-free. And those are usually legal fees and some of the, uh, those steps in the process in addition to time. And what we like to see clients do is get one, don't boil the ocean, right? Get one project done, figure it out. As Katie talked about, 
learn what's the best model and Sam, they've got it down to a fine science. What do they really want to do? What are their primary markets, et cetera? But do one, get it done, get the, as, as Katie said, I want to reinforce, get the right people involved, not just operations people or technical people, but the tax folks and your legal people, right? Can we monetize a tax credit? What's our approach going to be? Get everybody involved. And that's what's going to make the process better and ultimately increase your ROI. I appreciate that, Brenna. I think so much of this is coming down to uh, who and when um, for a lot of these. Um, but And also because I know from our poll at the beginning, so many people join this webinar because they're early in the process and making these, some of these considerations. So I like that kind of actionable, um, you know, I guess tip from you of just getting started <laughs> and, and finding that first project for sure. And I would just tack on, and it really goes to what I said earlier, which is taking into account that internal staff time for those first few projects. I don't know that that was necessarily accurately captured for us um, because I, I, you know, when you're starting out, you don't always know exactly what you're in for with respect to that. So I think we may not have been as conservative in those staff time estimates as, as we could have been. You're muted. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. I appreciate that perspective. Um, Great. Well, then continuing in the ROI theme, we'll move on to the next question here, which is, what do you consider an average ROI? And what would you consider value, i.e. what percentage increase in resale? Um, so it's a pretty specific question. So I might um, open it up to any of our panelists. Yeah, Sam is raising his hand I, uh, I old school one. style. So go, in, go for it, Sam. <laughs> yeah, so we, we, we fought for this um, in, in my prior life because I think a lot of folks don't actually know how to depreciate these things. I, we land on a 20 year straight line um, for the for the project. Generally, the panels are going to have, depending on where you get that gear panels from, but your tier one panels are going to have a 25 or 30 year warranty that comes with it. So we landed on 20 years to really commingle the warranty time of the of the module to the balance of plant equipment. Right, inverters are are, are usually a 10 year um, asset, and then you have you know wires, cables, everything else. Uh, so we kind of we kind of got comfortable. On that side, um, you know, in terms of the you know terminal value, you know, solar, is, you know, this isn't this isn't real estate. Solar is, is not an appreciating asset. It is a depreciating asset of which, if you monetize the tax benefit, you've already depreciated the entire thing by by using makers. And so, you know, it's it's I'm you know you'd have to go back to your CFO to ask if this is something that you can lever up on. You know, I don't think I don't know if you can borrow against a solar asset. Um, but I do know uh, just from having friends in the industry at places like Brookfield Renewable and, and of course at Blackstone, you know, you, you can buy uh, merchant projects at if maybe an 8x or 10x at best um, on a 10-year on a or a product that's 10 years in, just because I think there's, there's just such, a, such an explosion for demand in, in, uh, in renewables. Um, but I, but, I, but I, think, I think it's pretty subjective and, and the market's very dynamic right now. Yeah, Just I guess. add to that. I don't think there's a. So sorry, Katie. Go ahead. I keep like cut her off. Well, it's, sorry. it's hard with Zoom, right? It's hard with Zoom. So I'll go first this time, and then I'll Please. pass it off to you. Which is to say, um, you know, we talk about it at Tower in in terms of payback, and right, we're looking at how many years is it going to take to pay back. Um, most of our projects are in like the two to five year range. Um, and again, as Sam just said, that's in part because of our structure. Um, we are able to take full advantage of, you know, depreciating that asset at year one and some of these federal um, tax credits that are very meaningful um, to companies like ours. So um, I think our largest project is going to be over five and it's probably going to be seven ish years, maybe. But again, for us, we're long term owners. We're not concerned about the percentage increase in resale. We, we're looking at the value that's going to be created. Um, reputationally, and also from electricity demand savings um, over time. I'll just build on exactly what Katie said. So if you assume a five-year simple payback, that's a 20% expected return. And if it's a two-year, that's a 50% expected return. Who wouldn't want that in their 401k, a 50% return? Uh, even 20% is a pretty a reasonable return. And the way I would tie it back is what is the underlying rate of capitalization for the asset? If you were valuing that asset today, what would you 
use as your, your cap rate uh, to value it. I know Sam touched on this, I've touched on this. If the underlying asset is a four and a half cap, then that means anything over four and a half percent should be accretive to your asset value. And that's usually how it's done. There's a simple payback or there's a return that you're looking for and that varies by company. Great, thanks everybody. I think those are all really uh, helpful, like concrete answers that people can actually take and utilize. Um, so I think we only have time for one more question here, and I'm actually going to just uh, choose my moderator's directive, and I'm going to skip down a couple <laughs> um, to surprise everybody. And I would like to ask, between CapEx, so capital expenses, um, power purchase agreement, or efficiency as a service, um, which funding model has worked best for most participants? Um, and I will encourage our speakers to be uh, brief or high level with this, because we have just a couple minutes. And I see Brenna's nodding her head. So I might yeah, go ahead her. and kick it off with Brenna. You know, it's usually some form of, of lease versus even a PPA, CapEx, or energy as service. It's actually none of the above, typically. It's what Sam's getting at, which he's getting a roof lease. So he's not spending CapEx. He's not buying the purchase on site, which is a power purchase agreement or a PPA. And he's not funding the install using energy as a service type model. So it's really none of the above. Typically, in what we're seeing, it's more, hey, I want a roof lease and I want to sell the power into a community solar program or other utility program. And that's the most efficient. And as an owner, as I've said before, right, we're self-financing. So, so CapEx is our model. And that Thanks. is very clearly the winner as far as the funding model for us. And I, I've sat in a few different seats. I think. Um, you know, in, in the currency, because the utilities aren't in our name, right? As Brenda said, it's, it's way easier for us to, to lease the roof. But, but remember, that means that we get no environmental or renewable kudos. It's, it's no different than having, mm -hmm. you know, Tesla rent space in your building. You're not renewable because Tesla is a, you know, is a tenant. So like our, our structure um, is, has very little, if any, environmental benefit. Um, we are just the, the vehicle by which um, new solar capacity is created because we own the building, right? But, but the way the community solar program works, I see there are a couple of questions, is that the, communities, the community gets aggregated and the offtake is what um, allows for this long-term cash flow to allow the project to get financed, right? Um, and so, so typically on my end, that's, that's why it takes so long for our, pro for our program to actually uh, to grow, right? If we, if we were an owner, operator, occupier, like we could actually consume and, and finance the um, the investment ourselves, like we could at at Chase, then you know we we got 200 megawatts done in two years, you know, depend that, and that's all about how long it takes to interconnection. So so I think it it's very subjective how you can pursue solar to your operating model in terms of how your tenants pay rent and pay utilities, and also how your how your own um, company is is structured. Thanks all. I think that really does drive home the point that all of you are saying is it really depends on your, your stakeholders and your business model. Um, but on the flip side of that, I would like to put forward that that means that there are plenty of solutions to pursue. Um, it's just about finding the right one. Um, with that, I have a couple of conclusion slides. If we can go back over to the deck. Um, the first is that this is, of course, a part of a larger webinar series um, for the Better Buildings um, webinar series. And we have a great lineup um, of presentations all the way through April. So you can visit the Better Building Solutions Center to check out our upcoming ones. Um, and in fact, I invite you to jo join us for our next one on March 1st, which is entitled Work Smarter, Not Harder. We all like that. Um, creative Project uh, and Process implementation, and implementation. And that's from our Better Plant Partners. Um, I also would like to invite you to join us for the Better Buildings, Better Plants Summit coming this May, May 17th to 19th, 2022. We are hoping to have this in person um, and I could meet all of you in person, but we'll be making a decision by the end of February on that. So stay tuned. Finally, um, as I know has been popular in the questions, um, I will say that additional resources, slides and links will all be available to you. Um, on the Better Building Solutions Center, and we'll follow up with an email to everybody who registered for this. 
Um, and with that, I would like to say a, a very heartfelt thank you to all of our panelists, your insights, your you know balance between the, the, the data perspective and answers and business case, and then also just general value and how to work with your stakeholders was super helpful. Um, clearly from our poll, there was a lot of interest in exploring this topic uh, and you all provided the expertise and the experience that we were looking for. So thank you so much. If your question was not answered, you can follow up with our speakers or myself directly. I'd also encourage you to follow Better Buildings on social media to stay in touch on all our latest events and happenings. And yeah, thank you all so much to our audience as well. It was a pleasure having you and we'll see you again soon in the Better Buildings webinar series.